Hi, everyone. Uh, like Lauren said, I'm Jay McCrite. Uh, I am not the brother of a previous blogger that you may have heard of. Uh, I am transgender, and I look a little different than I did last time. Uh, and that's part of what I'm going to be talking today about today. Um, and I know that's a little bit ironic, given that probably the thing I'm most known for in the skeptic movement is a good book. But that's just how life goes sometimes. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's honestly really an honor to be back here at Skepticon. Um, the last time I gave a talk here was literally a decade ago at Skept Skepticon 4. Um, and I admit I didn't really put the family reunion theme into my talk itself, but uh, it just really resonates to me that this does feel like a family reunion to me to see a lot of people who have been my friends and mentors over the years that I haven't really seen in a decade since uh, some of the talks that came previously by Debbie and Greta talked about you know activism burnout and that happened to me. It's been a long time since I've really had the spoons to immerse myself in the atheist skeptic movement again after some of the stuff that happened that we don't need to unpack. We know what that was. <laughs> but I'm honestly really happy to be here. Um, I've always said Skepticon was the one conference I would come back to one day. And when I heard from Lauren, it's actually happening. I'm like, here it is. Let's do it. So thank you for giving the platform to talk. Um, all right. Oh, I guess, how do I move my slides if they are not on my screen? Wait, can I click it if I go over here? Aha, uh -huh. OK, we figured it out. Tech problems. I'm sorry if this image is <laughs> triggering to you. <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know or can't see it, this is Marjorie Taylor Greene hanging, hanging up a sign outside of her office uh, saying that there are two genders, male and female, trust the science. And that's, ugh. yeah, if your reaction is, ugh, that's correct. <laughs> um, and that's where the title of my talk today comes from, the trust the science. But I'm going to be telling you that the science says sex and gender is actually very complex. It's not so simple as just being a simple binary of male and female. And this has been something that you know, I've learned both in my professional career. Uh, I do have my PhD in genome sciences. I guess that's one thing that's changed since the last time I was on stage. I've been doing science communication professionally for five years now. But also just as a transgender person, and if there are any other trans people in the audience, yeah, woo. Uh, there's a joke amongst our community that in order to be trans, you kind of have to have a PhD in biology, that you self-teach yourself uh, all the nuance that is around sex and gender, because most people out there have a really simplistic worldview when it comes to this. Um, you know, a lot of people maybe have never had a biology class since middle school. And when you're in these really introductory settings, we don't teach all the nuance that there is involved in science. Um, like Peasy's talk about earlier, that even with genetics, it's not just Mendel. It's actually much more complex than that. And we teach these simple, introductory, you know, not nuanced takes so that people who are 12 years old can get a general grasp of the concept. And there are practical reasons why it's useful to know that there are generally males and generally females. But then we have people like this. Or we have other people who are now making whole books and documentaries on what is a woman, like it's some sort of gotcha, that it should be a really simple answer to that question. But the reality is it, it's not simple. And now, if you're debating this person or ones like her, you're not going to change her mind. She is completely entrenched in Christian ideology, in the patriarchy. There is no reasoning with people who are so far off on the fringe of just basically hating transgender people. But I wanted to give this talk today because there are a lot of people out there whose minds you can change. And I know it can be hard if you yourself don't have a PhD in genomics and you haven't been spending decades studying the nuance involved here to even have those conversations. Like, how do I answer the question, what is a woman? Like, what, how, how is the right way to answer that? Um, so 
I'm here today because I'm hoping this gives you s at least some information that, again, you're never to conven convince the fringe people, but like members of your family who might be well-meaning, but just kind of look at the whole trans thing as being kind of weird. But they're like, well, I know they're men and women, so what's, that just seems wrong. That seems not natural, like what's going on? And those kind of people can really be swayed by propaganda like this, because it seems convincing, right? Like that's, most people are men, most people are women. Yeah, there's sperm and eggs, sure, it seems binary. But again, it's complicated. And so I feel like I even have to caveat this talk, if this shows anything about me, that even this talk as I was creating it, I was stressed out because even this doesn't feel nuanced enough for me. That there are probably going to be people in the audience who are either trans or biologists, and they'll be like, well, that's, that's not totally true. That's kind of a summary. And you know, you're right. Again, you have to condense it to 45 minutes. I can't get it into every single exception or matter of nuance. But if you can just generally take away from this that sex and gender are much more complicated than you think, that's a win for me. So. All right, let's, so I, one thing I'll add there is, if you think, why hasn't Jay brought this up yet? I'm probably about to get to it. And if I don't, please bring it up in the Q&A and let's have more discussions because, again, there's way more nuance. All right, so to just kick it off, sex. It is more complicated than you think. And I'm not talking about the act today. I'm talking about sex as in the concept of being male or female. And for the moment, I am just going to put aside gender completely. We're not going to talk about the difference between sex and gender yet. I mean, Marjorie Taylor Greene, she ignores the distinction, so we're going to ignore it right now, too. We're just going to talk about sex. So what is, quote unquote, biological sex? That's a term that we've been seeing come up more. Um, and I'm going to tell you up front that biologists don't really use the term biological sex. When you see those two words put together, it's really a word from the right that is supposed to insinuate that sex is true and biological and all that gender stuff is just, that's just made up. Um, but the reason why we don't really say biological sex is because it's not really meaningful if you're a scientist. How do you define biological sex? The right will often say, oh, it's about chromosomes or it's about gametes, what gametes you produce. But the reality is your sex assigned at birth is 100% due to a, you popping out of your mom or a parent. <laughs> and the doctor looks at your genitals and makes their best guess of what category you fit into. They don't look at your chromosomes. They don't look at what genes are on those chromosomes. They're not looking at your hormones. They're not looking at what organs are inside your body. They're not looking at what sexual, secondary sexual characteristics you're going to develop in puberty. They're literally just taking a look at what's on the outside and making their best guess. And that's why a lot of trans people use that term sex assigned at birth um, instead of biological sex as some sort of truth. Because it's really a judgment call being made by a doctor. And as I listed all these things, again, it, it's complicated. It's not just one thing determining sex. And even amongst each of those individual variables, the only one that really is truly binary, and even this probably has some exception that I'm not aware about, are gametes. You have sperm and eggs. But again, if you look at chromosomes, I'm a geneticist, so this is the area I know most about. You know, most, most females have XX chromosomes. Most males have XY chromosomes. But there are a range of exceptions when it comes to just chromosomal sex. There are people who are, just have a single X chromosome, those that are XXY, those that are XYY, those that are mosaic, where some cells of their body might have some set of cr sex chromosomes, and other cells in their body have a totally different set. So you can have XX in some cell, XY in others. There is so much diversity, even amongst chromosomal sex, that even though it is the go-to example of how simple it should be, it's actually very complex. And even then, there are people who, you know, cisgender women, so women who are assigned female at birth, go their whole life, 
knowing their gender is being a woman, and they later find out they actually have XY chromosomes. And the opposite can happen for men, where they actually have XX chromosomes. And often these things aren't really discovered because again, you're not looking at your chromosomes. People get surprised when they do genetic testing or they hit puberty and they're not having kind of a normal developmental puberty like a woman oh, here having her period. And then when a doctor actually goes and looks, what organs do you have in your body? Oops, she doesn't have a uterus or she has testes. And all of these examples are out there. It's not necessarily a strict binary. There's all sorts of stuff going on in the middle, really. And this is why I like to say that it's technically more accurate to say that sex is bimodal, not binary, and that in general, most people fall into one category or other, but there's all sorts of diversity in between. It's, it's practical for us to often categorize it as one or the other, but that's not actually reflective of biology. And even then, when I say these things or talk about the exceptions, the exceptions are actually more common than you think. Again, because a lot of people are either intersex or maybe not following into that exact definition. Again, who makes that definition? But they aren't fitting into the perfect binary and they have no idea until later in life or never. And so if you don't know to look for those things, you don't count those people as examples. So it's actually probably much more common for people to be intersex than we even know. Now, one thing I also want to hit on here is that sex is often assumed to be immutable. You can't change sex. You can maybe say you're another gender, but you can't change your sex. That's always going to be the same. It's biological. But for trans people on hormone replacement therapy, that is not true. Um, when you look at the hormonal profiles of a trans man on testosterone or a trans woman on estrogen, they look more like, the trans man looks like cis men and a trans woman looks like cis women. Um, trans men grow phalluses. They can get hard. They can ejaculate. Trans women can experience PMS symptoms, even though they don't have a uterus. Um, so they can experience the cramping and the psychological issues that go along with it. Trans women who are on HRT long enough can breastfeed. And all of this happens because we start in the same place developmentally. And it's, we have the programming innate in us and in our genes, regardless of if we have XX or XY chromosomes, to really be either of those sexes. So sex can be changed. Um, and that's why even though you know, some people would like to like label me and myself as, oh, you're still technically female, from a scientific point of view, that's not really accurate anymore. Uh, I don't really, I don't match either group at this point now that I've been on testosterone for a year and a half. So what about gender? That's obviously the next step in this process. Like, Sex, we can, we can assume like that's really biological, that's what's determining it. Um, and that a lot of times in like kind of one-on-one -on -one level discussions, people will be like, oh, well, sex is biology and gender is psychological or cultural. And they kind of try to make this distinction that they're separate ideas and if only we can get people to realize their difference, then that way they'll understand that some trans people have that mismatch. But the reality is even transgender identity is influenced by biology. There is a biological component to being trans. We might not know every single detail about how it works. There might not be a test to, <laughs> well, that's a scary concept anyway, to test if you're trans or not. But there are a lot of things that hint towards transness being, bio, having a biological component. And I say component because like really any trait out there, there are going to be genetic influences and environmental influences. So for even things like height, it's not purely determined by your biology. It could also be determined by your diet and upbringing so that you had a nice, healthy, nutritious diet, you can grow taller. Um, but there is some component of transness that is innate. 
Um, we can look for information out there that hints towards this, even if it isn't fully figured out yet. Um, one place I would start is just remembering that the brain is an organ too. The brain is subject to evolution. It is subject to all those hormones that are in your body. It's subject to gene expression. It is an organ in your body. So if you can accept that all those other variables I shared, like chromosomes, hormones, presence of organs, can be more complicated than a simple binary, you can also accept that the brain might be more complicated than a simple binary. It's yet another variable where maybe it's trying to, trying, <laughs> maybe evolution has developed in a way that most of the time people fall into one category or another, but there are going to be exceptions in between and people who have mismatches between their sex and their gender. And one thing that we can look at to see if there's some sort of innate component, um, one of the first steps in genetics before you do something fancier like a genome-wide association study is a twin study. And when we, we do twin studies because in general, if you look at identical twins and those twins tend to share a trait more than non-identical twins, that hints that there's some sort of genetic component because those twins have the same genetics. And that is what we find for transgender people. When you look at trans twins, if you are transgender and you have an identical twin, they have a 20% chance of being transgender versus a non-identical twin has a 5% chance of also being transgender. And given that trans people are about 1% of the population, that even the non-identical twins have an increased rate because they share genetics even though they're not uh, identical. So twin studies are one hint that we have that there is something genetic contributing here, even if it's not, again, Mendelian and simple. There's, it's complex, but there's something going on there. Oh, I was trying to, okay, got some weird pop-up, but you didn't see that, great. <laughs> Another thing that points to transness being at least partially genetically influenced is that we see transgender identity in very young children. And we really see gender identity in general. Um, little kids, cis and trans, know their gender identity. They have very strong feelings about it. Um, and when we look at trans kids, who even as young as five are saying, mom, I'm not a girl, I'm a boy, um, those feelings persist through childhood, even despite society constantly telling them wrong, telling them they're wrong, and people trying to get them to act another way. It's a, it's a excuse me. Hello, oh, there we go. That it's in high 90%. If you are a transgender child, you're going to keep being trans. And this sort of, again, hints towards the innateness that these children have not been influenced by culture. They popped out this way. Um, and we also see this when we start looking at stuff like brain scans. Um, in adults, if you scan the brain of a trans woman, her brain looks more like a cis woman's brain than a cis man's brain. And the same is true for trans men. There is something <laughs> going on there biologically, again, in the brain. And it's also related to um, like the concept of physical dysphoria, that trans people often feel like there are parts of their body that don't really match what should be there. And like, uh, the one example that I know more because I'm transmasculine is that a lot of trans men actually experience uh, dysphoria akin to phantom limb syndrome with their genitals in that they expect a penis to be there. They feel like it's there, but clearly no, it's not when they look down there. Um, and it's been linked to having the similar effect to someone who's like lost an arm and can still feel an arm being there. Your brain has mapped out that you're, it's expecting that body part to be there even though it's not. Um, and we also see that when trans people undergo HRT, they are often much less depressed and experience things like lifting of brain fog that they just function better all around and the description of being it's often described as finally having the hormones your body expects to be running on um, so there's clearly something even though we don't again we don't have a test i hope there's never a test because 
that has all sorts of cultural implications. But there is something going on here that is biological. It's not a strict divide where sex is biology, gender is culture. Um, they really are linked and related and influencing each other. Another thing that also points to transness being some sort of biological component is that it has always existed and will always exist. Um, and I'm not just saying that some like brave statement, like we're going to make it no matter what, but <laughs> queer people, so trans people, intersex people, gay and lesbian and bisexual people, we have existed throughout human history. And that's because we are a natural part of human diversity. We are influenced by these biological variables and we are part of a spectrum of diversity that is going to just keep popping up. And that's why efforts to eradicate us or things like conversion ther therapy just don't work. Um, even if, heaven forbid, every trans person on the planet right now was murdered, there would be trans people being born in the future because it has an innate component. And a lot of people are skeptical about this because there seems to be this idea that transness is a trend, that oh, why am I hearing about trans issues so much all of a sudden, that the last few years, all you're hearing about trans this and that, younger people tend to be trans more than older people. And so there's this concept that like, it's this modern invention from the last five years, it's trendy, and it's popular. First, I don't know anyone who's transitioning <laughs> for popularity. It's scary to transition. Um, trans people go through decades often, at least I did, of denial and fear because society treats trans people like crap. <laughs> like just me speaking personally, it was a long time where I looked at trans people and I was like, gosh, I wish I could be like that. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not, that sucks. <laughs> you know, like, oh, I wish I could be, I could wish I could, look, I'm so jealous of them, they can just be a man. And with time, it became, ooh, no, I do relate to a lot of what these things they're saying, but I can't choose to do that. That's gonna ruin my career. That's gonna make my family abandon me. I'm gonna be labeled as a freak. And that's how society treats trans people. It's a kind of reasonable fear to have that fear. So no one is tran transitioning for a popularity con contest. It is hard to publicly transition. Um, but I wanna go back to this idea that it's a, it's a recent trend. One of the reasons we think transness is a recent trend is one, because it's punished by society, like I just said. And the example I always give that I think resonates with people is left-handedness. There used to be a time where you were punished for being left-handed. Kids in school, a nun would be wrapping you on the fingers, and you were forced to write with your right hand. And once that fell out of fashion, the rate of left-handedness skyrocketed, and then eventually leveled out once we hit this equilibrium. And left-handedness is partially genetically determined. It has a genetic component as well. And that's kind of what we're seeing happen now, in that as society has gotten more accepting and there are more examples of trans people out there and just the language of being able to describe yourself, there are more people saying, oh, this is how I've always felt and I can finally just do it instead of living in fear. Like, I, it really took me, again, personally, to see people like Jonathan Van Ness calling himself or themselves or herself, because she uses all pronouns, um, non-binary, to be like, oh, I'm not the only person who feels that way. So a lot of it isn't that the rate of trans people is changing, it's that trans people are just more likely to come out because they're not afraid anymore. And another part of this is that, frankly, trans history has been violently erased. There have been campaigns to make sure people don't know that we exist. <laughs> I hate to say that we're seeing it happen again now, all these don't say gay and trans bills, keeping trans kids out of sports, all of those are motivated by people who fear that if their kid sees it's okay for someone else to be trans, oh, they're gonna be trans too. They don't want trans people in public. They don't want others to know that that's an option out there. Um, and, you know, it's motivated by really Christian 
patriarchal norms, mostly. Like, that's where it's coming from, and that there's Adam and Eve, there are strict gender roles, and once you start dismantling that system, scary, because other things can fall by the wayside. And I think a lot of people don't even know that, you know, transness has gone back a long time. Um, there was, uh, I'm going to butcher this because it's German, the Institute for Sexual Wissenkraften, sorry, <laughs> whoever is typing <laughs> the coverage there. Um, but it was run by Magnus Hirschfeld in Germany, and it was right before uh, the Nazis took off. And this was like the cultural hub for trans people in the 1930s. Um, they were already doing gender um, affirming surgeries to trans people. They had all sorts of research and records from thousands of years in the past of the existence of trans people through history and different cultures. And the Nazis burnt it down. They burnt all the books. And I've heard some recaps of this horrible event saying that it's really set back transgender research almost 100 years. We just lost all the past research that was ever done on what, like, why are trans people trans? What helps trans people? Magnus Hirschfeld, his number one treatment for trans people was to literally just socially transition and be amongst trans people in a safe environment where you could be yourself. It wasn't radical. That's what the AMA and every other medical organization nowadays suggests and supports. But we had to rediscover that information because it was violently erased by Nazis. So if anyone tries to tell you that transness is just a recent fad from the last five years, they're just flat out wrong. We see records of transness going back thousands of years into like really early history. Now, I've talked a little bit about biology and kind of focusing on the science, because I am a scientist and that's where um, I focus. But, you know, science doesn't exist in a vacuum. There is a lot of cultural influence on how we interpret variation. So for example, you know, if we look at hair color, pretty uncontroversial. If you have blonde hair, black hair, red hair, maybe redheads get some flack. But like, you know, we don't really treat them differently. We accept that's just natural human diversity to pop out different ways there. Um, but you know, there are some biological traits that aren't really treated that way, even though they are naturally occurring diversity. So an argument I often run into when I'm talking about these sort of things is like, sure, transness might have some sort of biological component, but clearly it should be treated like a disease that needs to be cured. It doesn't matter if it's just part biological because other things that are biological are disorders and diseases. And clearly we know that men are supposed to be men and women are supposed to be women, and that's what nature intended for those two to pop out babies, which also I think shows how transphobia is really connected to both misogyny and homophobia. It's all about recreating those strict gender norms and any deviation is, it's a defect. And a lot of this is just how we look at human traits culturally. Exceptions the rules and the averages that most people fall into aren't necessarily defects. And there are a lot of traits that I think are good examples of this that the culture is already changing. So like, for example, deaf communities, blind communities, autistic community, all those groups used to be seen as a defect that needed a cure, needed to be fixed so that you are normal. But there are deaf communities out there that don't want a cure because they have their own culture and they want their children to grow up in their culture and they don't actually see anything wrong with being deaf. The problem is that society does not support deafness. There aren't, it's not, you're not accessible to everyday interactions because it's been built for people not like you, even though we can make it so it is more accessible. That is a cultural judgment on what is a disease or not. It's not a scientific truth. It's not that there's something inherently wrong with being blind or deaf or autistic or trans. It's that our society rejects them and does not make space for those people. And on top of this, 
there has been, I'd be remiss if I didn't highlight this, but there is intersex people, I don't want to make, make play the oppression Olympics, but they have it even worse than trans people. Um, intersex people have had a long history of corrective surgery being done on them at birth as infants before they can consent in order to fit into these neat boxes of male or female, even if it has no medical benefit, even if they can urinate properly, even if they can reproduce, it, no matter what it is, it's just a total physical, it just doesn't kind of look right and we want them to fit in with society. So we're going to change your genitals surgically without your consent. This has even happened in the past without parental consent. It used to be the norm. The doctors just did it. They did not have to ask anyone for consent. Um, and that in itself makes, it, makes being intersex seem rarer than it actually is because those people were violently erased. They were changed from their natural diversity. Um, and I will say we're starting to see progress here in how we look at intersex in issues. Um, coming from, again, biology world, the, the endocrine society used to call these sort of things disorders of sexual development. But they now call it differences in sexual d development. So it's not a disorder. There's nothing wrong with being intersex. It is, again, a difference. It's just part of human natural diversity to sometimes pop out in the middle of the spectrum and not at either end. And likewise, um, we're seeing more and more countries around the world ban intersex surgeries and making it so those people can reach adulthood and consent to it themselves if that's what they want, but not having it forced on them by a medical establishment. And really, ultimately, a lot of this happens, the erasure of the exceptions, because humans are predisposed to try to fit things into categories. We are really good at categorizing things. And part of that is a useful skill. It's useful for me to say, oh, that's a tree. And we all collectively know kind of what the category of tree is. Even though if you talk to a biologist who specializes in studying trees, they would tell you that's a very complicated question of what is a tree. It is not as simple as you think. But it's useful for the average person just living their life to be able to call upon those categories without getting into a deep philosophical discussion. And we're seeing the same thing happen with what is a woman? That yes, in general, we can say a woman is this type of person who tends to have these set of characteristics that co corresponds with each other, but there are going to be exceptions to that rule, and those exceptions matter. They're not defects. And I think one way to illustrate this is that people have trouble conceptualizing anything that doesn't really fit in categories that we've already established. For example, you know, oh, bisexuals, they don't really exist. They're actually straight or gay. They're, you know, they just haven't made up their mind, but they'll figure it out. They're going to fit in the cat category. Or even biracial people. Oh, Obama's black. Even though he's half white, we just cannot conceive of what category to put someone who is half and half, let alone have more ancestries than that. We're just not very good at it as humans. It is a conscious effort to understand the nuance that is there. We're just frankly not very good at nuance. And finally, a lot of people, you know, they tend to think of science as this source of truth and objectiveness, that the science says this. Even my talk, you know, trust the science. We're going to trust what the science says. But, you know, science doesn't live in a vacuum. Humans do science. Science is influenced by culture. It's influenced by politics. Um, you have to ask yourself, who's doing the science? And the answer for, for the last hundreds and hundreds of years until really, relatively recent history was scientists were cisgender, heterosexual, white, mostly Western European men who had financial privilege. They were a very specific category of all the diversity of humanity that actually exists. So when a scientist is going and defining how do we define sex? 
you know, they're not taking into account the experiences outside of their own life experiences. They are coming up with these definitions of what a male is or what a female is based on their worldview, which again, these scientists were also mostly Christian. A lot of this comes from the whole patriarchal idea of like, there was God created man and a woman, and that's how it is. They were influenced by that culture even when they were coming up with these scientific definitions. And this still you know, persists in science today. If you open any random average scientific study that involves humans, they're probably going to categorize people as male or female. And part of that is, again, practicality. There is usefulness in just being able to have categories that we can compare and not necessarily look at the exceptions. But that doesn't mean those exceptions don't exist. And the reason why most studies don't call out intersex people or trans people is because they don't think to include them in the study. Or if they are included, you throw out that data because there aren't enough people in your study to reach statistical significance to actually look at how that's affecting that group of people. And so how would you have to actually do a nuanced study looking at all the sex and gender diversity out there you need money <laughs> to go recruit more people. And there isn't funding right now to make every scientific study inclusive on sex and gender, even if it is a reality that those people exist. Our data is just thrown out and seen as in inconsequential. <laughs> even worse is sometimes we are in studies and we just get lumped into one group or another. We're not even considered. They just assume we are one way, which is even worse when you consider, I, I know there must be some studies I'm in, because I used to participate in, in research as like a subject a lot, that is labeling me as female even if I'm on HRT for years and I don't have the hormonal profile of a female anymore. And if you're doing a biological study, that might matter. <laughs> that might matter that different genes are being expressed. And so you're actually not even doing good science anymore to ignore that aspect of what's going on. But really, one thing I want to highlight is that these standards for how we define what is a woman or what is a man, they are rigid biological standards that, again, are influenced by culture and society and they're often impossible to hold, to stand up to, even for cisgender women. Um, and I think the gr group of people who are really affected by this are black women, and really all non-white women. And that, the, again, the people who are defining what is a woman, what, is it, like, what attributes does a woman have, they're white men who are basing this off an ideal of white womanhood. And we see this when we look at things like the Olympics and who gets tested for their testosterone levels and kicked out of the Olympics. It's always black women, not white women. Um, it, they don't necessarily fall within the culturally defined norms of white womanhood, and so we see them as falling out of that category, even though they're cisgender women, which is at higher levels of testosterone. Um, which, again, even there, it illustrates why this isn't necessarily tied to science. Testosterone levels aren't actually linked to performance. When you look at cisgender male athletes, there's no correlation. It's not the guys who are pumping out more testosterone are stronger and better and faster. It's not simple. And part of this is because everyone's body uptakes testosterone differently. So even if you have higher levels of testosterone, well, maybe you're metabolizing it differently, and so the end result isn't the same. And so going and saying, all right, women, your testosterone is too high, just frankly doesn't even make sense. It's like, it's like those people aren't naturally better because their testosterone levels are higher. And really, if you even zoom out further, Olympic level participation, all those people are mutants. Let's just be honest. <laughs> they are all on the edges of the bell curve. That's why they are performing at that level. Michael Phelps literally has mutations that enables him to be such an amazing swimmer. Google Michael Phelps mutation, you'll find articles that talk about this. Like, he is a genetic freak of nature, to be honest. Like, he is a very rare exception. 
But we don't have any problem with Michael Phelps because his uniqueness isn't breaking a gender binary that our culture is really invested in upholding. That's really where this stems from. It's not from necessarily having some sort of advantage. It's that, ugh, you're not just male or female, that's weird. <laughs> that's really where it's coming from. Now, I've spewed a lot about biology, I've talked about the science, and I think I'm about to maybe undermine my talk a little bit, but ultimately, none of this matters. <laughs> and I picked the image from the James Webb Space Telescope because I don't know if you're like me, when I saw this image, I was like, I am a speck. Why do I care about anything that <laughs> I care about? I get a little too nihilistic. It's been, it's been the pandemic, guys, sorry. You know, that's just kind of where my brain's gone. But like, really, even if intersex people, trans people, gay people, queer people, even if it was purely cultural, purely just a whim, I just want to do this, there's no scientific biological underpinning, who cares? If it doesn't hurt you, let them do it. I mean, we don't define ethics by how natural it is. Rape is something that has happened throughout history. We don't say that's okay because sometimes apes do it. No, we still recognize it as wrong. And when it comes to transness, me transitioning does not affect any of you. Unless you maybe want to marry me. That might have, you know, an influence, but no proposals yet, please. <laughs> um, so really, it's like we are on a speck in the universe with all these other planets out there, all these other galaxies, and we're sitting here debating what seems like an absurd debate. Like, we evolved to be this way through a natural process. The only reason even sex exists is through evolution, and the reason evolution produced mostly 50-50 male-female in mammals, obviously we get into funguses, it gets a little wacky. Um, it's, it's mathematical. I'm not gonna get into the details because, wow, that was the most boring class I took in grad school. <laughs> Sorry to that professor. I just don't like math. Uh, but uh, it's, it's all mathematical. You reach an equilibrium w that is 50-50. If you start getting too many females, it naturally starts going back to 50-50 for mathematical reasons. It's driven by this natural process. It's not God coming down and saying, there's a man and a woman. There's nothing enforcing that binary other than culture. And so even if you know, sex and gender, they're influenced by biology, it doesn't necessarily give it moral or ethical meaning, you know, I look at it as trans people don't affect your life. So just let them live and let them be. And the fact that society is in such a furor over such a tiny percentage of people just being slightly different from them is frankly absurd <laughs> when we are just one rock in this whole big thing. <laughs> and on that, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Yeah, hand back there. Uh, a little, so there's often this idea that transness is a fad that's really taking off in recent times, especially amongst young people. Um, first, uh, so a lot of that, com he, uh, Michael Schirmer, <laughs> um, <laughs> he has very problematic views on trans people. Um, that's the short version. Uh, his views uh, stem from an author, Abigail Schreier, who wrote a popular book recently that went into what you were saying. 
Um, the short version is her book is just, it's not scientific. It's not, it would take me a whole hour to debunk her book. Um, trans people have always existed. And trans children have very strong concepts of their gender identity very early on. Those identities persist even with culture trying to get them to be not, not that, to not be trans. Um, and when we look at those people, when they become adults, and even like 10 years later we check in on them, they don't detransition. They know they are trans. There's really not a lot of controversy there. What's actually happening is we now have, we're not isolated anymore. Most trans people went through the experience of, wow, I feel really weird and alien. I don't relate to my gender and I don't get it, but I must just be the only one. And now there is finally just access to information. There's language out there that is out there on the internet. And you can be like, oh, that is how I feel. I'm not alone. I'm not the one <laughs> weird freak having these weird feelings by myself. It's really more that you know, we haven't been hiding the existence that transness exists. And so people can are more brave about coming out. So um, a lot, there's also a lot of studies where they look at like, you know, trans kids, um, a lot of trans children are given puberty blockers so that they can wait until they are 18 and fully adults and can then decide if they want to, you know, go on hormone replacement therapy and like fully kind of go through with it, which not all trans people are on HRT anyway. Um, it's only like 30%. It's not everyone. Um, and when you look at those like trans boys is what they actually are, they stay trans boys and they stay trans men. It's in the 90% they don't change their mind, and they're very happy with their decision later. Um, and ultimately, I think really where a lot of this fear comes from is that it's really rooted in misogyny, in that women are seen as not as smart. They're seen as incapable of making their own life choices and decisions. They're seen as easily influenced and swayed, and it's just not not the reality. Um, it's also rooted in misogyny in that a lot of people's determinants of worth of womanhood is based on being sexually attractive to men and popping out babies. And they're very threatened by the idea that there are a whole generation of people assigned female at birth who aren't subscribing to those norms of wanting to be sexually attractive to a man and pop out babies. And it's not that that's what's motivating them to transition. That's a side effect of it. But that's what culture is concerned about. Um, so I would just say, like, if you hear those things, you should have a healthy dose of skepticism. Um, I feel like I'm not doing it justice because, again, I could probably talk about that for hours. Um, but just, yeah, keep a s skeptical mind about I think it'll go back to something I said in the beginning that no one transitions out of popularity. Transitioning is scary, especially for children. <laughs> I, I was only able to transition because I basically tamped down feelings that I had since age five for 30 years until I was at a point where I was financially secure, I was at a company that was super progressive and I knew would not fire me if I came out. Um, no one is doing it for whims. Even, even children. Um, and ultimately, I would say that the risk of a couple children thinking they're trans and later finding out they're not is worth it for the vast majority of trans people, trans children, to live the life that they want to live and to be happy. And really, that's why we give puberty blockers, so they can make the decision on their own. Um, if you are a child who you know, was on puberty blockers, you get to 18, you're like, no, that actually, I am my gender assigned at birth. 
there is no really detriment to having been on puberty blockers block for that time. It's medically safe to do so. Like you'll just start puberty later. So it is inherently coming from this fear that transness is bad. It's bad to be trans. That like, oh, if my child makes the wrong choice of being trans when they're not, wow, what a terrible thing. But like, why? Why is it a terrible thing if they think they're trans for a little bit? Like, there is nothing inherently bad with being transgender. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't looking there. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm going to be bad at really summarizing that, but hopefully this summarizes it in that, like, if you look at the scientific studies, the rates of regret for going through, like, gender affirming surgeries, top surgery, are lower than literally any other surgery out there. Like, and it's usually based on external forms Yes, it's like people, <laughs> trans people don't regret going through that. Um, when, so really, when you're, when you're having this fear of, like, well, what if the trans... What if the kid isn't actually trans and we're going through this? You need to think about not the 1%, I'm making up a number, that might actually end up still being cis and have just kind of gone through some thoughtful exploration, exploration for a while, which really doesn't matter. Like their biology will continue once they're off blockers. Um, you are saying it's more important to protect those cis children and to let all the trans children out there still have absurdly high rates of suicide and depression because it's more important to make sure that a couple cis kids never think they're trans than to give support to trans children. Like that's really what's being said in that moment. I see a question there. Also someone stop me when we hit time because I don't know when I have to stop. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, five minutes. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the question was, is there research on like how many trans, what percentage of trans people get either hormones or surgeries? Um, I'm really bad at pulling numbers off my head if I don't have them written down, but uh, I do know that like for surgery, it's even like 30%-ish. Like it's not 100% of trans people go on hormones. It's not 100% go on surgery. And part of that's because, you know, some people just don't want to. They're, like they don't necessarily just want to change their body. Like it's, it can involve I don't know, it, it, part of it, it can be social. Like if I start visibly looking different and growing facial hair, I might get fired from my job because I'm now openly transgender. Part of it is due to medical accessibility in that I'm very privileged in that I have a good job with good health insurance. And even with that good health insurance, I have to pay out of pocket a lot of money <laughs> to get trans affirming care. And so if you're poor, you might not be able to do that even if you want to. There's also a lot of gatekeeping in that I can only tell you how many different meetings I had to have with psychologists to prove to them that like I have researched this thoroughly and I am not making this on a whim. It's something I've literally been obsessing over over the last 20 years and I have a PhD in genomics and I still have to convince them that I'm sound of mind to make my own decisions about my body. So there probably are more trans people out there who want to access that care than they just can. Um, and it's definitely especially scary given 
fall of Roe and just anything <laughs> relating to privacy about what trans healthcare access is going to look like in the future because testosterone, um, I don't remember which schedule, schedule something drug, like it's very hard to get it, it's very regulated to get it. So there are a lot of hoops to jump through. It's not, it's not easy. Just be like, I went to my doctor and I got estrogen today. You're like it's just, it does not happen in that way. <laughs> it's so hard to actually get to that point. And that's part of the reason why you don't see people who are just like, oops, I thought I was trans and I'm not. Like very rarely that can happen. And often the reason people detransition is because they don't have supportive social environments and are kind of forced socially to detransition. And those are super rare compared to the bulk of what Yeah, so the question was, um, in the past, there's been a number out there that about 1% of people are trans. Is there better data out there, like how many people might fit in that category or not fit in like a strict gender binary? Um, again, I'm not super great with numbers if I don't have them prepared, but um, I do know that that number is going up. And again, that's why it seems like, oh, it's a fad because more people are identifying that way. But um, again, I, I go back to the example of like left-handedness that like once you get, oh, the societal, I broke it, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> the societal pressures gone that it does go up. And we do see in younger groups where, again, because there are less pressures um, that seeing it as bad, it does go up. And I'll also say part of it, it's not just because young people are more able to come out. A lot of trans people have not survived being trans. Um, we have less trans elders because they couldn't get access to care or they were murdered or unable to openly transition out of fear. Um, so a lot of what we see about, oh, it seems like it's skewed young, it's probably the same across all age groups. It's just younger people who are finally able and brave enough and have the society in which they can feel like they can come out. Yeah. I think we have maybe time one question. Thank you so much for giving me the time to be on this today. Thank you.